Will you join with me in a word of prayer? Oh, gracious and loving Heavenly Father, I thank you for a beautiful day that you have given to us. The truth of the matter is, Lord, is each and every day we have is a beautiful day. Each and every day we are given is a new chance, a new beginning. And so, Lord, I don't know how people felt when they woke up this morning, but I pray that you just remind us all that you are with us and that you love us. And this is a new start. So we gather here this morning to worship. And worship renews us, it fills us. It enables us to face life. And so, Lord, we come here to honor you, but we also come here for ourselves, to draw close to you. So, Lord, meet us where we are today. You know each and every one of us very, very well. You know the struggles we face. You know the joys that we feel, but you also know the hurts and the pains. You know today, as we gather together, there are many that are struggling with needs. And Lord, we have many needs. Some of them deal with physical struggles and illness in our own lives or in the lives of someone we deeply care about. Some of those needs deal with relationship problems. Some of them deal with emotional needs. Some of our needs are financial. Some of them have to do with worried about a job or, Lord, there is so much going on right now in each of our lives. And so we just take a moment in silence, to lift the things that right now we need you to hear the most in our lives. Hear us as we pray. Lord, thank you for listening. And may we know that even now you are already at work in our lives, in the lives of those we love, in those situations, and even we, though we may not see where you're working right now, remind us that you've got us and that you're going to see us through. Lord, as we, as we gather today, we come hungry, and we're ready to be fed spiritually. And so, we pray that as we gather together, you will touch our hearts. And maybe it's going to be through a hymn that is sung. Maybe it'll be through that beautiful piece of music that Megan just shared. Maybe it'll be through a scripture or the message. Maybe it will be through a kind word that someone says, or Lord, maybe the call is for us to in some way reach out to someone around us before we go out the door. Lord, in this time, we are yours. And so speak to our hearts, speak to our lives. Make us ready to go back out into our world. Lord, our world is so broken and there's so much going on and and there's so much that we just feel that is so beyond our control and, and, we're, and we're frustrated and sometimes we're angry and, and sometimes we just don't think there's any way we can make a difference. But Lord, you can. And you working through us can change our world tremendously. And so Lord... 
That's our prayer today. That you will prepare us so that you can work through us wherever life takes us this week. And in those situations that we don't know an answer to, remind us that you do have an answer. And so we pray for one another. We pray for this congregation and this church. We pray for our community. And Lord, we pray for our world. And just ask your grace. Remembering that you loved us so much that you gave your son Jesus Christ on our behalf. And through him, all things are possible. And so, Lord, we come before you and we remember the words that you yourself taught us. Hear us as we pray these words this morning. And may they not just be words shared by memory, but may they come from our hearts and represent an attitude through which we will walk this week. Hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Well, good morning. In, in case you uh, happen to be nodding off when Mark was sharing just a little while ago, and, and in case you're a little worried now that you look at me, I am not Nathan. And he did not shrink and get a little more squatty. Um, he actually is in, in North Carolina. And I, I just got to say, you know, his son is playing ball in Myrtle Beach. Really. I mean, uh, when our kids went to play ball and we had to go somewhere, it was usually... Nowhere, Pennsylvania, or you won't find it, Indiana. And so I just wish him well. I, I, I um, hope he has a great week, restful time. A um, little bit about myself. My name is Jeff Waite. Some of you, some of you have met us, my, me, myself, my wife Ruth. Uh, some of you have no idea who we are, so let me give you a little bit of background. Um, I was a United Methodist pastor. I'm a United Methodist pastor. Uh, served churches for 41 years. And I know you're going, no way. He can't be that old. I am actually 39, but um, I've served churches for 41 years. And um, we came to uh, Columbia Heights about a year ago, and we generally attend the first service. And I I just want to say that we were so blessed by this church. And you guys are doing... I hope you realize that you did an amazing job of really doing what it is that God wants us to be about, and that's growing to be disciples. And you do a beautiful job of, of caring for each other. And I just, I just really want to, we have been blessed through this church, and we're growing through this church, and, and be thankful for who you are. And uh, we're glad to be here and be a part of it. Um, and I also want to say, I, I, I hope, and I'm assuming you are, but I truly hope that you are excited and blessed and feel like what a wonderful thing it is that you have Nathan as your pastor. Because he truly is a man of God. He, he loves the Lord. He loves the Word of God. And uh, he really does a beautiful job of sharing that in a way that he helps to connect with us what that means. And, and I know that um, you were thinking this morning that you were going to be a part of that series that he started about going through the Bible, and I'm excited about it too, and he's doing a beautiful job with it. And to be totally honest with you, you know, he asked me if I wanted to just carry on with that series, and I thought, no, this is, this is Nathan's series, and I wanted, this, I wanted him to be able to share it because, because I think God's given him some really unique insights on that. And so I, I'm going in a different direction this morning. And what I want to talk about is um, Jesus told us that his intention for us is that God's intention for us is that we should have life and have it abundantly. And so I want to talk about, uh, and as you see on the, on the screen there, learning to mount up with wings like eagles. How do you do that? Well, based on the scripture from Isaiah 40, verse 31, and this is, this is the actual scripture itself, 
This is from the New International Version. It says this, And those who hope in the Lord, that's the next slide, will renew their strength, they shall soar on wings like eagles, and they shall run and not grow weary, and they'll walk and not be faint. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I, I've had, there's some scriptures I've always loved. There's certain scriptures that have had a lot of meaning to me, and, and for years and years, those scriptures, I, I go back to those over and over again. This is one of those scriptures, and I love the encouragement that it offers. It's one of those verses that has always had a tremendous amount of meaning for me. And yet, when I hear those words, I can't help but think about a guy from my first congregation, an interesting guy. He was a, he was a, 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 a funeral director. His name was William. And uh, William was the kind of guy that liked to, like, throw you off a little bit. And in his office, he had a plaque that was based on this verse, but it was a little bit different. And it said, it's hard to soar with eagles when you're surrounded by turkeys. Now, William used to get a big charge out of watching people's reaction to his poster. But, you know, the thing that um, probably hit me the most about that uh, plaque on his, in his office was, sometimes in my life, I can identify with it. Can you identify with that? Have you ever noticed sometimes the people around you or the circumstances that you're faced with in life are just discouraging and negative? And how in the world are you supposed to mount up with wings like eagles when you're surrounded by that? We all want to live vital lives in faith in Christ, but sometimes we often go through our days and we feel defeated before we ever get started. So how do you do it? How do we learn to mount up with wings like eagles and soar as men and women of faith in an oftentimes negative world? Now the author of Hebrews tells us, run with perseverance the race marked out for us. often easier said than done. What is the secret to do in that? Well, again, I think, as we do with everything, I think, in our Christian life, to understand how to do that, we look at our example, which is Jesus Christ. How did Jesus remain faithful, and how did he keep soaring amidst, oftentimes, when he was surrounded with insurmountable obstacles? I mean, think about his life. Day after day after day, he had people wanting a piece of him. And oftentimes he was surrounded by people that were very, very negative. People that didn't agree with him and people that, that wanted to destroy him. And oftentimes there were difficulties, so many difficulties that he had to deal with. And yet he kept going. He kept on track with what God had him to be about. How did he do that? Well, I believe the answer for Jesus seemed to be prayer and the strength that he received in those times of fellowship with his Father in heaven. As the disciples watched Jesus over time, one of the things that they couldn't help but notice was that oftentimes Jesus would go off by himself to be alone with God. And they saw him do this time and time and time again. And what they noticed was when he came back from those times, he almost seemed to be energized. And it made such a difference in him, so much that they came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray like that. Now, whether or not these disciples realized it, they had stumbled upon the key to a vital life of faith. And so here's the thing. I believe if you and I are going to find vitality for ourselves in our Christian walk, 
we're going to have to learn to mount up with wings like eagles and soar amidst our days, despite circumstances that often seem difficult. Prayer has to become a vital source of our life. And if we look in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, we're going to hear Jesus giving some guidelines on developing a vital prayer life, guidelines that apply to our lives as well. And uh, the main passage I'm focusing on comes from Matthew 6, and the verses are 5 to 13. I was going to read the whole thing, but I'm not going to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read some segments of that, and you're going to have that up on the screen. There's probably no other place in the Scripture that gives us a more straightforward guideline in the area of prayer than Jesus' teachings in these verses. And in these verses, I hear Jesus calling us to do three different things that will help us develop a vital prayer life. Number one, the first thing that Jesus is calling us to do if we're going to learn to soar like the eagles is you and I need to learn to pray secretly. Pray secretly. What in the world does that mean? Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go into your room. Close the door and pray with your Father who is in heaven. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now think about those words. and Think about what that, how you, that would apply to your life. Where in your life are you intentionally making space so that you might have a secret place to be with God? Where is that happening for you? It's real easy. We live, we live in such a fast-paced life. We're always on the go. We're always doing something. We're always heading somewhere. And with our hectic lifestyle, it becomes very easy to get caught up in the trap of only shooting up what I call arrow shot prayers. Now, you know what those are because I believe you do that too. You're driving down the car and you're heading down the highway and you remember, oh yeah, Lord, Lord, I got this problem. Can you help me take care of that? Lord, so-and-so, I love them and they're really sick right now. Can you be with them? Lord, tomorrow I've got to make this decision. Help me with this. And, 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 and they're one-liners. And I do them, and I'm sure you do them too. And here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with those one-line prayers because God is always listening to his children. And he hears those prayers. But oftentimes, if our prayer life only consists of one-liners then we're losing out because we're not having the opportunity to have time amidst our prayer life to have fellowship with God. And it's the fellowship, the time with God, that ultimately equips us and sustains us. So for the nurturing of our Christian spirit, we need to find time and make the opportunity to step out of our routines and simply be in his presence. So I just simply ask you, where is that happening for you? How is that happening? Like I said, I've been, I've been in ministry for 41 years, and we served five different congregations. And one of those congregations, I remember very, very dearly, it was a little tiny rural community in Logan County, north of Bell Fountain, called Bell Center about 700 people, some very beautiful individuals, and we served a church up there, and a lot of really, really neat Christians. And I remember one very deeply committed Christian man by the name of Glenn. He was a farmer, and he liked to talk about his secret place with God. And for Glenn, it was out in the fields where he could just be with the Lord amidst the beauty of God's creation. Glenn used to say, you know, it was those times, it was those minutes, those moments, when it was just me and God.
when is it that it's just you and God? Where's your secret place and your secret time with the Lord? Folks, being able to mount up with wings like eagles begins when we find that time. When we have regular fellowship and we pray to him. Pray secretly. But not only that, secondly, Jesus would remind us that our prayer needs to be sincere. Prayer must be sincere. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, verse 7. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. In all honesty, as a child growing up, I got I to gotta tell you, we really didn't do church on a regular basis. My mom was Methodist, my dad was Presbyterian, so we kind of bounced around a little bit, and we go to different churches. The main church that I remember as a child that probably would say, we probably would have said if we were going to say that was our church, was a very, very large church beautiful, gothic-style church in, in Youngstown. It was a Presbyterian church. It was bigger than life. The building was bigger than life. And um, the pastor was Dr. Montgomery. I didn't even know his name. Dr. Montgomery. And uh, when I would look at him as a little cot, he was a giant. But then again, uh, most people are giants to me. But no, he was probably, he was well over six foot. He's a very, very tall guy, very distinguished looking guy. And when I would see Dr. Montgomery, it was on Sunday morning, and he wore these beautiful robes, and he would stand in the pulpit, and the pulpit was raised. The platform was, was pretty high up. And uh, so you would be looking up at him, and he had this booming voice to talk like this. And when he prayed, he used kind of a King James English. And so there was a lot of thines and thuses and things that I really didn't understand. But for a little kid, <coughs> excuse me, growing up in that atmosphere, what, what, that, what that communicated to me was, if you're going to pray to God, you have to learn to talk like that. But I didn't know how to talk like that, so I just didn't spend much time talking to God because he's not going to listen to me. I don't know the God talk. Now, I'd like to say that I grew out of that pretty quickly as a child, but I really didn't. And it was, it was well into adulthood before I began to understand that God really wasn't interested in my language. He wasn't interested in my words and the way I put things. He was interested in knowing what was going on inside my heart. Psalm 62, 8 says this, Pour out your hearts to the Lord. God cares so much for us that he wants to know exactly what's going on in our lives. And he wants to know about where we're hurting. He wants to know about where we've messed up. He wants to know about where it is we need to be ministered to. He simply wants us to be honest and sincere. Truth is, we can tell God anything and know that he will forgive us and love us unconditionally no matter what. We know that because of what he did for us in Jesus. But it's a hard lesson for us to live out, and the reason is simple. We live in a world where love and acceptance is very conditional. So we learn not to reveal ourselves to one another. Now, you know this to be true. You got close to somebody, and you shared something with them. Something maybe that wasn't very positive or very rosy, and suddenly they reject you. 
and that hurts. And you don't want to have that happen again. And so what we do is we learn not to tell those things about ourselves. We learn to put on a facade. We learn to share pe with people the good things that they're going to want to hear. And we hide everything else. But with God, it needs to be just the opposite. If we're going to become overcomers and we're going to grow in our faith, we need to learn to come honestly and openly before our Lord. We need to learn to pray sincerely. But that's not all. We also need to learn to pray specifically. This when you come down to, to Matthew 6, now we're coming to the part of the scripture that most of us are familiar with. Let me start with reading this, starting with verse 11, little segments of it. Jesus tells us to pray, Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, we know that prayer. Most of us know that prayer. We said it this morning. Probably you say it every Sunday morning here at this service. Many of us have come to know it by heart. But I believe when Jesus, when he's sharing that prayer with us, he isn't doing so much so that we learn to recite the words. I believe his intention was to teach us that we need to learn to tell God about the specific needs and desires of our heart. In his letter to the Philippians, Paul tells the church, this is from Philippians 4, 6b, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now notice that it says here, in every situation situation. God wants us to get very specific. He wants to know about the decisions that we're struggling with, not just the huge ones, but even the smaller ones. God wants us to care enough about him and trust him enough to open up about those things. He wants us to hear about our relationships, not just the good ones. He wants us to hear about the relationships that aren't going so great. He wants us to talk to him about that guy that I just can't stand. That woman that drives me nuts. Lord, help me. He wants us to hear about our problems at work and the struggles we face at home. He wants us to know that he loves us enough to want to know it all. So let me ask you, where do you need to be a little more specific in your prayer life with God to respect, with respect to what's going on? And not simply say, Lord, bless me today. You know it. Take care of me where you know I have needs. He wants you to talk about those needs. Authentic life-changing, spirit-lifting prayer that strengthens and enables us has got to be specific to where we live. Finally, I'd address one more element that is vitally important in your prayer life and in your spiritual life as a whole if you're going to grow and be a vital Christian. You and I must believe in the power of prayer to transform, to heal, to equip, and sustain us in all of life. Let me put it simple for you. Do you believe that your prayers make a difference? Do you believe that God really is going to answer that prayer and it's going to make a difference? Do you believe that the God who created the universe 
who cared enough to send his son into the world to die for our sins and then brought him back alive again, can actually intercede and will intercede to your life in a positive way if we give him the needs of our life. Do you believe that? Jesus once said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. The problem is, oftentimes we're so busy focusing on the mountains of our life that we forget to focus upon the one who can move them. I want us to think for a moment about a very familiar Old Testament story. And even if you don't have a church background, even if you've not heard many of the stories of the Old Testament before, you've probably heard this one story of a young man named David and a giant named Goliath. God's people were at war with the Philistines. And the Philistines had this, what they thought to be, an amazing weapon. It was this giant of a man named Goliath. And they thought as long as they had Goliath, They didn't have anything to fear. Victory was an assured thing. And as we read the the account, if we were to go back and read it, we'd see that Israel's warriors are standing on a hill and they're looking at the battlefield. And about that time, the Philistine champion named Goliath kind of swaggers out. And his purpose is to frighten them. And he does a wonderful job of doing just that. And you can hear the warriors saying to each other, we are not going down there. We are not going to battle with that. Do you see how tall he is? He's got to be nine feet tall. Do you see his armor? Look at that spear that he's holding. And they're coming up with all kinds of reasons why they can't fight this giant. It's hopeless. Meanwhile, there's this young guy, this shepherd boy by the name of David, And he has a very strong faith in God. And he's come in from the fields, and he's looking at the same battlefield, and he's looking at the same giant that everybody else is. But as he looks at that giant, he's not thinking about the giant. He's remembering his God. His God that has been there for him, that has always walked with him, that he believed could bring about miracles. And so he's saying to these other warriors around Don't look at the giant. Look at your God. And all of a sudden he says, let me out there. Let me get him. Because he knows if he goes to battle with him, his God's going to be with him, and God will give him victory. And we know the story. He goes in with a slingshot and five stones, and the giant is defeated. Not because David was such a great warrior, but because God gave David what he needed. All because he didn't focus on the obstacle. He focused on his God. I believe probably every one of us here is standing in the shadow of at least one mountain that just doesn't seem like it is going to move. Maybe it's a destructive habit, a character flaw. What seems to be an impossible marriage, a work situation that doesn't get any better, a financial problem, a physical disability. I leave you with the thought of what is your immovable mountain? Are you aware that God is bigger than that problem? Or have you stood in its shadow for so long that you've grown accustomed to the darkness? And inwardly, when you finish your prayers, are you thinking to yourself, what's the use? So my challenge for us today 
is to learn to shift our focus in our prayer life. And don't spend so much time focusing on describing to the Lord your mountain, because he knows what it is. Instead, put your focus on the mountain mover, his glory, his power, and his faithfulness. Then start walking in faith, one day at a time, trusting in him, following his lead, and watch and see as that mountain begins to shrink. And you'll find yourself beginning to mount up and beginning to soar. Where does that need to happen for you? Let's join together in a word of prayer real quick. Oh, gracious and loving Lord, I, I don't know where people are. I know where I am, and I know what my mountains are, the things that I struggle to overcome. And my guess is that there, probably everyone here has something that just seems insurmountable. And I pray that in these moments you will remind us that you are bigger than any problem we ever have and that you can help us to overcome. Give us the faith and the strength to learn to pray secretly, to pray sincerely, Pray specifically, and most of all, teach us, Lord, to focus on the mountain mover and not merely on our obstacles. As we do, you will give us what we need to soar. Send us out to soar like eagles. In Jesus' name, amen.